This is a case of a boy who developed a traumatic third window syndrome after a snowboarding accident. He was treated with round window reinforcement surgery and later was found to have a cochlea facial nerve dehiscence on his CT scan. As an overview, I will discuss the peripheral vestibular system anatomy and physiology. I will also talk about the consequences of vestibular asymmetries. This will lead to a discussion about third window syndrome, and during that portion of this presentation, I will talk about the phenotype, that is, what patients experience and what can be measured. I will also review the current known sites of third window syndrome that could be seen with a CAT scan. I will provide the background of cochleofacial nerve dehiscence and also talk about CT negative third window syndrome. Finally, I'll present the case of a 12 year old boy who suffered a snowboarding accident and developed traumatic third window syndrome. I'll talk about his symptoms and recovery. His videos will reinforce these points and also talk about quantitative measurement of cognitive dysfunction and recovery. Normally, we have five different balance receptors within each inner ear. Three of them are responsible for sensing rotational forces, while the other two are responsible for sensing the force of gravity, as well as acceleration and deceleration type of forces. Each receptor is paired with a specific receptor on the opposite side, and as shown in this example, the right superior semicircular canal is paired with the left posterior semicircular canal, whereas the left superior semicircular canal is paired with the right posterior semicircular canal. All 10 of these vestibular receptors are constantly discharging and constantly sending nerve impulses back to our brain, even when we're sleeping or not moving. Remember, these receptors are paired, and so as we turn our head or tilt our head, the firing rate goes up on one side and goes down on the other. And normally, it's equal and opposite. This allows our brain to understand how we're changing our head position in space. This is also true for the otolithic or the gravity receptors within each inner ear. Again, these receptors are paired, and normally the responses that go back to the brain are excited on one side and inhibited on the other, and the brain is constantly doing the math to understand how we've changed our head position in space. When something happens to one inner ear compared to the other, and the input to the brain is no longer equal and opposite, the brain will see that difference and interpret it as you are still moving. If it's the rotational receptors, patients will have an illusion of movement, which is a true spinning feeling. If it's the gravity receptors, the patients will have a sense of dizziness. They often describe it as a rocky, wavy, tilty sensation. Sometimes it feels like the floor falls out from under them or they're pushed or pulled or tilted or flipped. This will then trigger the autonomic nervous system, which will cause nausea in most of the patients, but sometimes can cause a cold, clammy skin decreased heart rate, and even vomiting in more severe asymmetries. Particularly with the otolithic asymmetries, it can disrupt the brain, causing cognitive dysfunction, spatial disorientation, and anxiety. Normally, we have two windows of the inner ear, the oval window and the round window. Sometimes, there is a third window that can develop or patients can be born with these third windows. There are several that can be found with a CAT scan, and we'll talk about those in just a few minutes and also others that can't be seen with CAT scans with the current resolution that's available to us. These patients can have gravitational receptor asymmetries, and with exposure to loud sounds, they can experience a tilting or rocking sensation, nausea, dizziness, pain, headache, falls if their legs buckle out from under them, and also spatial disorientation. They're also able to hear internal sounds unusually well. They can hear their heartbeat or pulse, their breathing, their eyes moving or blinking in about a third of these patients. And they can also hear their chewing to be very loud to them. Their voice can be echoey and resonant, and they can also hear low-pitched tuning forks when applied to their extremities, although I'm not going to show that in this particular video. Third window syndrome patients can also experience cognitive dysfunction. They can feel fuzzy, foggy, spacey, out of it, memories poor, concentrations down. They can fatigue easily. They also feel ear pressure, which is a consequence of endolymphatic hydrops, a fluid buildup of the central compartment of the inner ear. And while this is common in many of the third window syndrome sites, it is uncommon in patients with cochleofacial dehiscence, as we'll talk about later. They can also have a pseudoconductive hearing loss. They can experience tinnitus and also migraine headaches. And this includes the three variants of migraine, hemiplegic migraine, ocular migraine, and vestibular migraine.
Third window syndrome should replace the nomenclature of superior semicircular canal dehiscence. This is important because there are multiple sites where a third window can occur and the phenotype is the same or very similar. There are many pathologies that can create a third window and result in this third window syndrome. Some can be seen with a CAT scan, which are referred to CT positive, and others that cannot be seen with CAT scan with the current resolution of the studies available to us. There are currently 10 known sites where a third window can be created as seen with a CAT scan. Superior semicircular canal dehiscence is the most common of these, posterior semicircular canal dehiscence, lateral semicircular canal dehiscence, although the clinical symptoms of vestibular dysfunction are a little bit different, posterior canal jugular bulb partition dehiscence, a wide vestibular aqueduct, post-traumatic hypermobile stapes foot plate, as described by Arun Gadra, cochlea carotid partition dehiscence, cochlea internal auditory canal dehiscence, cochlea facial nerve dehiscence, which we'll talk about shortly, and finally, the recently described vestibule middle ear dehiscence. What are the third window syndrome defects that cannot be seen with a CAT scan? Well, it could possibly be the medialis, where the cochlear nerve leaves the inner ear. It could also be unrecognized cochleofacial nerve dehiscence, as was the case with this child, or unrecognized cochlear internal auditory canal dehiscence. Perilymph fistula is also a possibility, and this can occur at the round window or the oval window, but are much more difficult to diagnose. Bob Young was the first to describe cochleofacial nerve dehiscence. He published a paper in 2014 in the laryngoscope describing these patients. They reported two patients who had third window syndrome symptoms. Both also had pseudoconductive hearing loss, as well as reduced thresholds by cervical vestibular evoked myogenic potentials. These findings are typical of a third window syndrome patient. Neither patient had surgery, however. The figure on the right shows the facial nerve depicted in yellow, the cochlea and vestibular portion of the inner ear in purple, the carotid artery in red, and the internal auditory canal in orange. What they've labeled as C represents the cochlea facial nerve dehiscence site. B is a cochlea internal auditory canal dehiscence site. What is labeled as A is a cochlea carotid artery dehiscence site. And all of these have been reported in the literature. What is labeled as D is a hypothetic cochlea jugular bulb dehiscence, although this has not been observed or reported. What is known to exist is a posterior semicircular canal jugular bulb dehiscence. Next, I'm going to describe three studies looking at the relative prevalence of cochleofacial nerve dehiscence. First was a study published by the group at Johns Hopkins Hospital using histologic studies of human temporal bones. They found that six out of 1,020 temporal bones were found to have a cochleofacial nerve dehiscence. However, 35% of these were thin enough, that is less than 0.01 millimeters, to appear as if it was a cochleofacial nerve dehiscence on CT scan. They also observed that a smaller otic capsule area correlated with thinner cochleofacial partition window, and they wondered if this was a developmental factor or if this placed a greater risk for cochleofacial dehiscence in older female and Caucasian patients. Next was a micro-CT prevalence study of cochlear facial nerve dehiscence in the Uppsala temporal bone collection. They used 334 molds but studied 282 that they analyzed for cochlear facial nerve dehiscence. They found that 4 out of these 282 had a cochlear facial nerve dehiscence, which represents 1.4% of this study population. It's also important to recognize that these patients did not have clinical symptoms of third window syndrome. The most recent study was published in 2018. This was work performed by Nick Blevins group at Stanford. They looked at normal temporal bone CTs and found that 5.4% or 22 of the 406 ears that were studied had cochleofacial nerve dehiscence. If you looked at the patient number, 9.2% had cochleofacial nerve dehiscence, and of those, 1.4% had bilateral cochleofacial nerve dehiscence. Of these 406 ears, 12 were found to have a facial nerve dehiscence, 
22 were found to have a cochleofacial nerve dehiscence, and 33 ears were found to have superior semicircular canal dehiscence. Another interesting finding was that there were two ears that had both a facial nerve dehiscence and cochleofacial nerve dehiscence, and three ears that had both a superior semicircular canal dehiscence and cochleofacial nerve dehiscence. An important aspect of this study regarding the prevalence is that these were all normal patients and not patients who had third window syndrome. We still do not know the prevalence of cochleofacial nerve dehiscence in third window syndrome patients. With that background, let's talk about our case. This was a 12-year-old boy who in April of 2012 had a snowboarding accident. He suffered a concussion. He subsequently developed third window syndrome symptoms. He had sound-induced nausea and gravitational receptor dysfunction type of vertigo. He heard his eyes move and blink. He also had migraine headaches and nausea. His other third window syndrome symptoms and diagnostic findings included cognitive dysfunction. He had pseudoconductive hearing loss, but he was not able to perform the cervical vestibular evoked myogenic potential study because as he turned his head against resistance, he developed symptoms. His high-resolution temporal bone CT showed that on the right he had a cochleofacial nerve dehiscence, and on the left he had a CT-negative third window syndrome with no visible otic capsule dehiscence seen. Before I show the traditional images associated with the temporal bone CT, I wanted to show this colorized version that is also inverted. First, a convention, the right ear is shown on the left side of your screen, and the left ear is shown on the right side of your screen. The cochlea in this image is colored blue, while the facial nerve is colored yellow. As you can see within the red circle on the right temporal bone, there is no bony separation between the cochlea and facial nerve, hence the cochlea facial nerve dehiscence. If you look on the right side of your screen, you can see a bony separation between the cochlea and facial nerve, which has been labeled cochlea facial partition. This figure in the top panel shows the traditional axial image of a CT scan of the temporal bone. In the middle panel, this image has been inverted, which more easily demonstrates the relationship between the cochlea and facial nerve. In the bottom panel was the image that I just showed that includes the colorized cochlea and colorized facial nerve for both the right and left ear. His right ear had a cochleofacial nerve dehiscence, and since this was the most symptomatic ear, a round window reinforcement surgery was performed on 3 July 2013. His left ear was less symptomatic and was a CT negative third window syndrome, and this surgery was performed second using the same technique of a round window reinforcement on 23 August 2013. His cognitive dysfunction was thought by others to be due to his concussion. He was included in a study of 17 patients looking at cognitive function using a battery of neuropsychology tests that were performed before and after surgery, and this work was published in 2016. This test battery included the Beck Depression Inventory, the Dallas Kaplan Executive Function System, the Wide Range Intelligence Test, or RIT, using average verbal for crystallized intelligence and visual for fluid intelligence. We also use the wide range assessment of memory and learning of the RAML2 to assess verbal memory, visual memory, attention and concentration, as well as working memory. This battery of neuropsychology tests were performed before surgery and every three months after surgery. One example that will be shown is that of the Dallas Kaplan Executive Function System. One component of this test is called the trail making test. With this task, the subject is requested to draw a line between 1 and A, A and 2, 2 and B, B and 3, 3 and C, and so on until 16 to P is connected. The next two images show his performance before surgery and then again three months after his second side surgery. This is an example of one of his preoperative tests in one specific condition of the trail making test. As you can see, he performed the task in three minutes and 22 seconds. He made 22 errors and importantly had no insight that he made any mistakes in performing this task. 
Three months after his second side surgery, he performed this task again. He completed it in 1 minute 38 seconds and made two errors. During these errors, he self-corrected, which is important for scoring purposes, but you can see the improvement in his cognitive function in performing this specific task. Postoperatively, he had resolution of his sound-induced nausea and gravitational receptor dysfunction type of vertigo. He could no longer hear his eyes move or blink. His migraine headaches and nausea improved initially and then resolved later. He also could not hear the 256 hertz tuning fork when it was applied to his knees and elbows. He recovered his cognitive function, and one measure of that was his academic performance. Before his accident, he was typically an A and B student. After the accident and before his surgery, he was a C and B student, and then later, after his recovery, began earning A's and B's once again. To follow will be six separate videos. The first before his initial surgery, and then finally five years after his surgeries were completed. The first, he will be describing his preoperative symptoms, and this was recorded on 2 July 2013. His surgery was a right round window reinforcement procedure on 3 July 2013. Hi, I got hurt April of 2012. I got a really bad snowboarding accident, and I had a concussion. And then my symptoms started about Three to four months later, I had extreme dizziness, uh, headaches, migraines, all of it. And then um, I would hear noises in the head, my head like blinking, all that. My jaws would, my jaw would click. Um, chewing would be amplified. I uh, would get extremely dizzy to the point where I couldn't like play sports or hockey, any of that. I would uh, end up being sick the next day for almost the whole day and feel like I'd puke. Uh, I have the constant need to pop my ears and uh, yeah. What about loud sounds? Loud sounds, uh, they give me a uh, kind of amplified migraines to the point where it's kind of hard to function and uh, I will get like them behind my eyes and by the temples, and uh, they'll also amplify my dizziness. What about your thinking? How you doing in school? Uh, I was like C's and B's, where I probably could have been getting A's and B's, and then I would have uh, problems in foreign language because I couldn't memorize uh, the lessons and that. Next, he describes his post-operative symptoms the day after his surgery on 4 July 2013. Uh, it's the first day after surgery and all my symptoms are almost gone. Uh, I'm eating like crazy, have my appetite back, uh, not as dizzy anymore. I have barely a headache at all and I'm feeling a lot better. Were you able to hear any inside sounds before the surgery? Uh, yeah, I would hear my blinking, now that is all gone. In this third video, he describes his post-operative symptoms five weeks after the second side surgery. Hi, it's five weeks after my uh, left ear surgery. My ringing is a lot duller. Uh, my headaches are quieter. Uh, I had flown over here for the first time in a... Uh, our whole trips for the doctor and uh, I use my headphones and the sounds a lot pure it's not distorted as it was before um, my nausea is completely gone my stomach aches are gone I'm eating a lot more now and yeah uh, how's your thinking uh, I have I'm doing a lot better in school my uh, headaches are pretty much gone when I'm looking at numbers uh, my math grade's a lot higher than it was last year, same with my science grade, and I'm doing a lot better on tests than I was the previous year. And were you able to hear any internal sounds before all this started? Yeah, I could hear myself blink and uh, an occasional heartbeat, and uh, that's completely gone. I'm completely blink hearing free, and same with the heartbeat. This fourth 
video describes his post-operative symptoms eight months after his initial surgery on the right for cochleofacial nerve dehiscence and six months after the left ear procedure that was performed for CT negative third window syndrome. For both ears, round window reinforcement surgery was performed. Hi, my first surgery was eight months ago. My second surgery was six months ago. Since then, I've almost fully recovered. My grades are better in school. My um, concentration has gotten a lot better. I can work out longer without getting any dizziness or fullness in my head. That's about it. This fifth video highlights his post-operative symptoms one year and nine months after his surgery was completed. So since my last surgery, I've completely recovered. It's bad in how long it's been. Uh, I've run about four half marathons since November. My thinking's all the way back. I can study now and without getting headaches, I can do well in school. I'm not losing uh, not losing my thoughts and stuff towards like for my tests uh, overnight, which was happening before my tests when I would study. Um, I'm able to surf and do everything in the water. Uh, yeah, that's about it. <laughs> in this final video, he describes his post-operative symptoms as well as the type of activities that he has been able to perform and how he is doing academically. This was five years after his surgery and 6.5 years after his snowboarding accident. So it's been about six and a half years since my injury, five years from my first surgery. I'm showing no side effects. I'm feeling great. I just have some hearing loss in my right ear. Since my last video, I've competed in varsity golf, varsity debate, and I've ran over 20 half marathons. I spent my sophomore summer at the University of Michigan and my junior summer studying at the University of Cambridge. I'm now a senior in high school. I'm taking all of my classes in a dual enrollment program at a local university, and I'm maintaining about a 3.8 GPA. I'm going to pursue a double major in economics and finance. Uh, I just sent out my college application, so I'm still waiting to hear back on where I'll be going, and hopefully I'll be pursuing a law degree after that. In summary, after round window reinforcement surgery for cochleofacial nerve dehiscence and also CT negative third window syndrome, the cognitive dysfunction and spatial disorientation is reversible. Autophony is reversible, and so is the nausea. Sound induced dizziness or the gravitational or otolithic receptor dysfunction type of vertigo is also reversible. Finally, migraine headaches resolve or will be markedly improved such that they can be managed medically. Thank you for watching this video of a boy who suffered a traumatic third window syndrome after a snowboarding accident. On the right, this was due to a cochleofacial nerve dehiscence, and on the left, due to a CT negative third window syndrome. Both sides were treated with a round window reinforcement surgery.